you know, the Lord put something on my heart. We've been talking about strongholds and the Lord put on my heart as we were praying for these thousands and thousands of, of prayer requests and people with needs is the Lord reminded me of something. He said, son, I want you to tell my people how they can be sure that they will have their, their prayers answered, because so many people pray sort of um, just kamikaze prayers, you know, is just just pray and just shooting and stuff. And, you know, if it falls and dies, you know, if it, if it if it hits heaven, great. If it doesn't, then that's OK, too. But God doesn't want us to just pray random prayers and hope that our prayers get answered. He wants us to know that our prayers will be answered. He wants us to pray with confidence and pray with authority because God is placed within us this power to experience incredible breakthroughs through the power of prayer. And if you look at it this way, in this earth today are incredible natural resources, aren't there? When you think about in the world today, in the earth today, there are incredible natural resources that change the world every day for the better. You think of water and you think of coal and forests and the sun and the wind and the soil and natural gas and silver and gold and aluminum and copper and and all of the natural resources that are in this earth uh, bring amazing benefit to this world. They make the world a better place when we learn how to tap into those resources and direct those resources in the right direction. How many believe in the power that God has placed in this earth through natural resources? Well, there's something one person. Thank you for that one. <laughs> I saw that hand. How many believe in the power that God has placed in the natural resources in this earth? Of course, we all we all believe that and we all understand that. And while all of these natural resources are good, we have a supernatural resource that God has placed inside of us, a more powerful resource than the than anything else the world has ever known. It's the power of prayer. Prayer is not a duty or a ritual. It is the source of the greatest force of power the world has ever known. And it's available to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Prayer can't be stopped. Prayer can't be silenced. Prayer can't be turned off. It can't be defeated. Prayer can do anything. And sometimes, though, we listen to the devil's lie and it says we aren't good enough to pray. But he's only the devil says you're not good enough to pray. You haven't you haven't been holy enough. You haven't done enough right. You haven't done enough good or look at all the wrong things you've done. You've disqualified yourself because of what you did here. You've disqualified yourself because of what you've done there. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. The devil only wants you to think that because he knows how powerful prayer really is. He's only saying that because he's trying to move you off of prayer. But when you get a hold of how powerful this supernatural resource is, you will pray with boldness. You will pray with authority. You will speak to the mountains and they will move. Prayer is more powerful than anything you see with your natural eyes. It's more powerful than dynamite, more powerful than than gasoline. It's more powerful than nuclear energy. No matter how hard the world or the devil try, prayer can't be thrown away. Prayer can't be hidden. Prayer can't be silenced. Prayer can't be stopped. Prayer changes things. And you are carrying you're carrying the power to pray in the earth of your physical body. All the natural resources that God placed in this earth and then he made you out of the dust of the ground, out of the soil of the earth, and he placed inside of you a supernatural power in your earth. Just like there is natural power in the physical earth, there is supernatural power in your earth, the temple of God, where God dwells, his spirit dwells, his presence dwells, and the power of prayer dwells inside of you. How many are ready to tap into that power today? The most incredible thing that God, the most incredible things of God can never be received any other way except through the instrument and the authority and the power of prayer. Let's look at James chapter five, verse 17, and let's talk about this. And I want to share with you several things that will guarantee your prayers to be answered. And we're going to pull down the strongholds of unanswered prayer. We're going to pull down the strongholds of powerless prayer, because the reason why we pray and things don't happen is because we have a certain belief system or a mindset that there's something we did wrong. There's something we didn't do enough. 
there's something God is mad at us about or there's something God is holding out uh, uh, on us uh, from or there's something we've done wrong and God is punishing us without by not giving us the answer or we haven't done enough things right and therefore we haven't earned the right to answered prayer. And I'm about to show you so I'm about to blow that out of your head because we've got to pull down the strongholds that are keeping us prayerless and powerless in prayer. Oh, man, but I screwed up so much. I can't pray and God's going to hear me. First of all, you're right about one thing and you're wrong about the other. You're wrong that God can't hear you, but you're right that you screwed up a lot. But God doesn't withhold his power in prayer because you screwed up his prayer. His power is available to anybody who believes the following things that I'm going to share with you. But let's look at this verse. It says Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And he, he the word earnestly means he prayed with faith. He prayed with confidence. He prayed with zeal and boldness. He prayed boldly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months, three and a half years. Now, if if a, if a city or a region goes without rain for three and a half weeks, they're in a drought for three and a half months. They're in a serious, seriously bad condition. But for three and a half years, who's ever heard of that? Well, it's not heard of unless you read the Bible, unless you see that it happened in Elijah's day. And then I like verse 18. It says, and then he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain and the earth produces produced its fruit. He prayed that it would not rain and it did not rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed again and the heaven gave rain. Heaven wants to give some rain in your life today. Heaven wants to give some power in your life today. Heaven wants to give some blessing and some wisdom and some peace and some joy. Heaven wants to give some breakthroughs. Heaven wants to give some anointing. Heaven wants to give some healing. But you got to pray and believe that heaven hears and heaven responds. But the devil says, oh, he doesn't hear you because look, you haven't been Christian long enough. The devil doesn't hear you because you've been you look at how messed up your life is or look at all the mistakes you've made. And yet look at verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain. Now, what what is his nature like ours? What does he mean by that? It means Elijah had human nature like ours. Elijah was not superhuman. Elijah was human. Elijah was not a superhero. He was a man with a nature like ours. He cried. He was depressed. He ran. He was afraid. He ran from Jezebel because of fear. He ran under a tree and asked God to take his life because he was so depressed. He ran from the enemy at one point because he thought he was the only one who was really serving God. He was the only prophet left in the land. And God said, you don't have to be depressed. You don't have to run from Jezebel and you're not the only one left. But he had he, he was a man with a nature like ours. He stumbled. He fell. He made mistakes. He, he blew it. He he did things that he didn't. He did things that that we would that we would look at and say, how could a man like that fail that many times and still pray with this kind of power? How could a man like Abraham, who gave away his wife twice and who slept with Hagar, the the, the sla- you know, the servant of 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 Sarah and gave birth to Ishmael and gave birth to all these problems in the world as a result of not trusting God in those times. And yet when Abraham prayed, miracles happened. David was a man who who prayed and his prayers were answered. But look at his life. Look at the mistakes. And yet you're thinking you're disqualified. These were men that committed terrible acts against God and against people. And they weren't even in the new covenant. Jesus had not died for their sins yet, like he has already died for ours. And yet they still prayed with power. How much more we who are washed by the blood of Jesus, bought by the blood of the lamb, how much more can we stand with boldness and pray great prayers and and believe great things and speak to the mountains of our lives and command them to be moved and they will obey us if we simply believe. How could Elijah pray like this when he had a nature like ours? His nature, his mistakes, his shortcomings did not disqualify him from praying with power. 
and your shortcomings and your mistakes and the things you didn't wrong, the things you did wrong or the right things that you didn't do, those don't disqualify you either from power in prayer. Now, on the flip side, there are many people who think, well, there are some who think, as I'm already talking about, I don't do this enough, I don't do that enough, so I don't deserve to get my prayers answered. But then on the flip side, there are people who say, hey, man, I did this and I did that and I did that right, so I deserve my prayers to be answered. But neither of those are right. You neither deserve your prayers to be answered because of your holiness, nor do you, nor are you disqualified from your prayers being answered because of your unholiness. Now, don't shout me down. I'm not encouraging you to be unholy, but what I'm saying is your unholiness does not disqualify you from power in prayer, and just as your holiness does not qualify you for power in prayer. And there are strongholds that are controlling both groups of people. I've done this. How about that man that went up to the temple? I've prayed, I've fasted, I've given, I've done all these things. I deserve to go down justified. But the man who beat his breast, he said, I, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. He went, he's the one that ended up going down justified. So it's not what you've done wrong. It's not what you've done right. It's what Jesus has done for you and how he has already paid the price to give you the power to pray. And where does it come from? Well, it's in the same passage of Scripture in the verse right before it, James 5, verse 16. Confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another that you would be healed. And then look at what he says. For the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. A effectual, fervent prayer of a what? Righteous man avails much. Now, isn't that the word that we stumble over when we read this verse? Many Christians have stumbled over this verse for years. And why do they stumble over this verse? They stumble over it because they focus on that word righteous and they think that means doing everything right or making sure your good outweighs your bad. Well, this is no Santa Claus religion. This is no, you know, you better, you know, you better be nice. You better think twice or whatever, however the song goes. I haven't heard it in a year, so it's, I've forgotten it. But this word righteous is where so many people stumble. We have to realize something. Religion gets in the way of power in prayer because we read the words righteous man and we immediately begin to analyze ourselves and question ourselves to see if we're righteous enough to prevail in prayer. Have I really been that holy? Have I really done enough? You see, in the Old Testament, man attempted to be righteous by their outward actions, but Jesus changed all that through his actions alone. 2 Corinthians 5.21 shows us how we become righteous men and righteous women. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, for he made him who knew no sin God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us on the cross. He became sin for us. He never sinned, but he became sin for us on the cross. Why? So that we might become the what? Righteousness of God in who? In him or in Christ. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is the great exchange. He becomes sin, we become righteous. As you heard me say many times before, he became what we were so that we could become what he was before he became what we were. He became what we were so that we could become what he was before he became what we were. He became sin, we were sinners, we were sin. He became sin so that we could become what he was. He was already the righteousness of God. Now we are the righteousness of God. He became sin for us that we would become the righteousness of God. He became what we were so that we could, we could become what he was before he became what we were. Why? So that as he is, so are we in this earth. So that when, so just as, just as Jesus, just as Jesus commanded the blind eyes to be open, we command the blind eyes to be open. Just as he took five loaves and two fish and gave thanks to God for what he had. Listen, if you'll give thanks to God for what you have, he will multiply it. There is power, power in giving God thanks for what you already have.
It's the great exchange. The moment you were born again, you were made the righteousness of God in Christ. You no longer have to try to obtain righteousness from God. You are the righteousness of God. What does that mean? You have the right to stand before God without condemnation, and you have the right to stand before the devil without being defeated another day in your life. You have the right to stand before God without condemnation, and you have the right to stand before the devil with authority over him because he's been placed under your feet. And when you learn, when you discover who you are and Satan's whole mission and, and, and his whole purpose in messing with your mind is to get you to doubt your true new identity in Christ, the righteousness of God. Because, and why is it so important to know you're the righteousness of God? Well, let's take for example that the Bible says the favor of God surrounds the righteous with a shield. So why is it so important to know you're the righteousness of God? Because when you know it, favor is going to be attracted to you. Why is it so important to, to know that you're the righteousness of God? Because the Bible says when the righteous man falls seven times, he gets up. Why is it so important? Because a man who knows he's the righteousness of God, even when he stumbles, he'll get back up. A person who's already condemned, when he stumbles, he'll stay down. A person who knows he's the righteousness of God, when he stumbles, he'll get back up. Why is it so important to know you're the righteousness of God? Well, for, our, for the sake of our discussion today, it's so that you can pray with power according to James chapter 5, verse 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Not, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't barely get by. It doesn't just kind of stumble over the finish line. It avails much. It prevails much. It accomplishes much. It achieves much. A person who knows they're righteous will be bold to ask for the things that they would not otherwise be bold enough to ask for. Well, I deserve this sickness. I deserve this disease. We were going through the airport, and um, you know the duty-free shops, they sell so many cigarettes. But in, we, we had to go through Turkey. We went through Istanbul, and... Um, we get to the, to the airport, walking through the duty-free shops in, in, in Istanbul, and all these cigarette cases and cartons of cigarettes. And on the cover of them, you don't know what brand they are first. You know how, you know, usually you see Marlboro, or, or you see Salem, or you see, you know, whatever your favorite, what name your favorite brand, just kidding. Um, <laughs> You don't, you don't see the names of the brand first. First, you see in big letters on the, on the front of the cartons, in bold print and in large print, smoking kills. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I was so tempted to buy a carton until I saw the sign, and then I pulled away. <laughs> Some of you young people, I'm just kidding. So don't try this at home. Smoking kills. Every one of them said on the front, smoking kills, smoking kills, smoking kills. I had to get up real close to find out what brand they were because the front of them were covered with smoking kills. And what is my point in saying that? Smoking kills. <laughs> no, that's not my point. Here's my point. My point is, is you will say to yourself, oh man, I don't deserve to pray with power. I can't pray with power because I've, been, I've still you know, been struggling with the smoking addiction. I've still been struggling with this smoking habit. And I can't, and until I break this habit, I'm not going to be able to pray with authority. No, when you learn how to pray with authority, that's what's going to break the habit. It's, it's not, hey, as soon as I kick this drug addiction, as soon as I kick this alcohol issue, as soon as I kick this, this anger problem, as soon as I kick this pornography problem, I'll be able to pray with power. But as long as I'm as long as I'm struggling with this, I, I, I don't have the boldness to pray. You're right, you don't have the boldness to pray because you're attaching your boldness to your holiness, but that's not what God attaches your boldness to. Let's see what he does attach your boldness to. Look at Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1. Oh, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the holy 
are as bold as a lion. Is that what it says? The godly are as bold as a lion. Is that what it says? Come on, folks, this is not a trick question. This is right there in black and white. But the who? The righteous are bold as a lion. It doesn't say the sinless are bold as a lion. It doesn't say the holiness people are as bold as lions. It doesn't say the people that have prayed enough, fasted enough, read enough, done enough, been godly enough, been nice enough, be kind enough. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be those things. Be godly, be holy, be kind, be nice, especially to me. But make sure you realize none of those things are, God doesn't attach his power and boldness in prayer to any of those things. He attaches his power and boldness to prayer by being the righteousness of God. The righteous are as bold as a lion. So when I know that I'm the righteousness of God, I will go bold instead of going home. Too many Christians are, they, they, they're not going bold. We're not going big. We got to ask big. We got to think big. We got to dream big. We got to pray big. We got to go big and not go home. We've got to realize we've got boldness to pray. We've got authority to pray. We have confidence because we're the righteousness of God in Christ, not because we got our act together. Don't get me wrong. Get your act together. Everyone who hears the sound of my voice, if you don't have your act together, do your best to get your act together. But let me tell you something. If you got all of your act together, you'd be Jesus, first of all. <laughs> but if you got all your act together, that would not make you righteous. The only thing that makes you righteous is he became sin so that you could be made the righteousness of God and when you know that you're, you're the righteousness of God, you will pray with boldness and you will pray with power because the righteous are as bold as a lion and the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous will avail much. So what is my point here? Point number one, if you want to know why your prayers will be answered, it's that when you know it's your right, your prayers will be answered. When you know it's your right, it's my right to pray. I have the right to go boldly to the throne of grace and receive mercy and grace in my time of need. I don't have the right because I'm right all the time. I have the right because I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. That's why I have the right to pray. And see, if you think you don't deserve to pray with authority and get your prayers answered because you haven't done enough right, or you've done enough right, so you think you deserve it because you've done enough right, you will not experience answered prayer because you can't connect with heaven through your holiness. You connect to heaven through the gift of righteousness. That's why it says in James 5.18, it says, if you go back to James 5.18, it says, and Elijah prayed again, and the heaven gave, and the heaven gave, and the heaven gave, and the heaven gave. Did the heaven give because the heaven decided to give? And heaven decided, and heaven gave. Is that what it says? No, it says, and Elijah prayed again, and heaven gave. When did heaven give? When Jesus prayed? Well, Heaven gave to Jesus when Jesus prayed, but heaven gave to Elijah when Elijah prayed. Heaven's going to give to me when I pray, but not because I'm the pastor, not because I've been a Christian for 30 years, not because I only smoke these days when I'm really, really, really wasted on drugs. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't do drugs. I don't smoke but I'm not getting my prayers answered because of that nonsense. I'm not saying it's nonsense. It's good to not smoke. But the belief system that if I live holy enough, that gives me the right to pray is a lie. It's a stronghold. And I've come here today to pull it down. I've come here today to pull it down. Elijah 
was a man with a nature like ours. He ran, he was afraid, he was depressed, he was discouraged, he had self-pity, he had worry, he had anxiety. But when he prayed, he had power and heaven gave. And when you pray with power, heaven is going to give. Heaven's going to give. Heaven's going to give. Heaven's going to give. You remember what Jesus said? Let me tell you something. I'm giving you authority. And when you pray, whatever you bind on earth is going to be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Jesus gave us that kind of power and that kind of authority. And we need to start walking and talking and praying like we have that kind of power. Why? Because it's our right. And what and when did we get this gift of righteousness? When he became sin for us, we became the righteousness of God. And Romans 5, 17 says, it is through the abundance of grace and it's, notice what it says, for if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive, everybody say receive, receive. much more than those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, they will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Now notice how we tap into the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Those who what? Receive. Those who what? Receive. Those who receive. What are you going to do at Christmas? You're going to give gifts and you're going to receive. You're going to receive. Now when you receive a gift at Christmas, do you pay for it? When you receive, now I do, but when you receive, <laughs> my kids are like, hey, dad, look at what we got you. Okay, uh, yeah, I just noticed my account got dung, dinged, got rang, my bell got rang. You guys use my money for me. But they're like, dad, well, we can't afford what you want, so we have to use your money. No, I'm just kidding. I don't want, I don't want any of you. But... <laughs> But when you, when you get a gift, when you receive a gift at Christmas, when somebody gives you that gift, you don't give them $50. You don't pull out and say, can you give me the receipt so I know how much to pay you for this? But yet we are that way with God. God gives us the gift of righteousness and we're still trying to pay for it. He gives us the abundance of grace and we're still trying to pay for it. He gives us the power to pray and we're still trying to pay for it. And we still think, oh, what do I owe you for it, God? Nothing. Well, how come I don't owe you anything? Because I already paid for it. When did you pay for it, Lord? On the cross. When did I, did, I, did, did I do enough to become righteous with you? No, you didn't do enough, but my son did enough. You have the right to answer prayer. You have the right. Why can we know our prayers will be answered? Because I know there's still some people thinking right now, yeah, but what about me? I, I failed at this and I failed at that. The prayers of the righteous. The prayers of the righteous. You say, yeah, but I'm... I'm not as righteous as you. Yes, you are. You're as righteous as Jesus. He became sin. You became the righteousness of God. You became as right with God as Christ Jesus is. When, when um, Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob, Esau was the, the oldest son. He came out first, and then Jacob came out second, right? And Esau had the right to the blessing, and he had the right of, rights of the firstborn and the rights to the blessing of God through his father. And what did Jacob do? Him and his mother plotted this plan to cover his skin with hair, the animal skin, the hair of an animal skin, so that because his father had lost his sight, they covered his skin with animal hair so that his arm felt like Esau, his older brother's arm. Then he put all the, gar you know, the, the smell of a, of a dead animal on himself because Esau was a hunter, but Jacob wasn't. So he smelled like his older brother Esau. He felt like his older brother Esau. He gave a meal to his father as if he was, as if his, he was the older uh, brother Esau. And his father said, hmm... Come near me, my son, so I can give you the blessing. Come near, come near me, my son, so I can give you the rights of the firstborn and the inheritance. And he thought it was Esau. The father thought it was Esau, his older son, but it was Jacob acting like Esau by having the skin of an animal covering him, the smell of the animal covering him so that he would 
feel and smell like his older brother. And yet he said, draw nearer to me, my son. And he felt him and he smelled him. And he said, you feel like my son Esau. You smell like my son Esau, but you don't sound like my son Esau. But but you feel enough like him and you smell enough like him. Behold, I give you the rights of the firstborn, the blessing of my name and the blessing of my family. And you say, what is the significance of that? Because the word Esau is the Hebrew word for Jesus. And Jesus represents the older son. And we represent the younger son. And when we put on Christ, and when we put on his flesh, and when we put on his skin, and when we put on the robe of righteousness, and when we smell like his blood, and when we're washed in his blood, and when we stand before our Father covered in his blood, covered in the skin of Esau, Jesus Christ, then the Father looks at us and says, you might not always sound like the way you're supposed to sound, but you smell like my son Jesus, you feel like my son Jesus, I give you the blessing of my son Jesus. I give you the rights of my son Jesus. This is what it means to be the righteousness of God in Christ. And Jacob became the ancestor of Jesus Christ. And Jacob became the father of the 12 sons of Israel. And Jacob became Israel because he had the blessing of the father. He had the right to the blessing. Now in his case, he stole it. In our case, it was given to us. And Jesus is happy to give us his blood, his skin, as he is, so are we in this life. You have the rights to pray with this kind of authority. Number two, you are the seed of Abraham. Listen, The Bible says in Galatians 3.29, if we belong to Christ, we are Abraham's seed and we are heirs according to promise. If we belong to Christ, we're Abraham's seed or Abraham's descendants and we're heirs according to the promise. Now, how did you belong to Christ? You got born again, so you now belong to Christ. Why is this so important? Because I don't want you leaving here wondering if your prayers are going to get answered. I want you leaving here praying with boldness, praying with authority, praying with power, and expecting stuff to happen because you have the power of prayer because you're the righteousness of God and because you are the seed of Abraham. You say, well, okay, I'm the seed of Abraham. Well, how did Abraham pray? When when do we ever see Abraham pray and his prayers get answered? I'm glad you asked. Look at Genesis chapter, uh, I think it's Genesis chapter 20, verse 17. Look at what it says. So Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants, and then they bore children. Verse 18 says, because up until that time, the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Now think about this. The Lord closed the womb, but verse 17, Abraham prayed, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants, and they all bore children. So instead of people, so religion has told us, well, God closed that door, and God stopped this, and God stopped that. But look, God gave us the authority to pray so the door can get open again, to pray so the womb can get open again, to pray so the healing can come. Abraham prayed, and God healed Abimelech. God healed his wife. God healed his female servants, and then they all had children. What a powerful What a powerful man of prayer. Why? Because he was so godly and he never made mistakes. No, he lied about his wife being his sister two times. He tried to give away his wife several times. He tried to, you know, he tried to wheel and deal his wife. It was some wife swapping. It was life, it was wife changers, not life changers. And it did. (laughs) Some of you get that later. All right. (laughs) And yet. He still prayed, and God healed. He prayed, and miracles happened. And we belong to Christ. And if we belong to Christ, we're Abraham's seed, and we're heirs of the promise. And one of the promises was, when you pray, Abraham, I'm going to hear, and I'm going to answer. 
And so when I'm the seed of Abraham, when I pray, God's going to hear and God's going to answer because I do everything right. Heck no. Because I've never done anything wrong. H E double toothpicks. No. <laughs> but because I'm the seed of Abraham. Number one, because I have the right and the righteousness of God. Number two, I'm the seed of Abraham. Number three, because I don't deserve it, but Jesus does. Jesus deserves my prayers to be answered because he paid for them in his blood. And Romans 8:32 says, "He that did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things?" He freely gives. What does the Bible say though? To God freely gives it, but how do we tap into it? Ask and it shall be given to you. How will it be given? Ask. How, how will it be given? What do we have to do? Do we have to earn it? Work for it? Deserve it? No. What do we got to do? Ask and it shall be given. And how is it given? Freely given us all things. If he gave us his son, he will freely give us all things. You don't go to God in prayer because you deserve it. You go to God in prayer because the sacrifice Jesus made for you on the cross deserves to be honored and deserves to be glorified. And that's the reason you're going to get it answered because he gave us his son. Therefore, that is the access point to receiving all things freely. All we got to do is ask. And number four, be specific. Be specific. We went through so many of these prayers and we're just saddened by people being vague. And if you're praying vague prayers, you're going to get vague answers. But if you pray specific prayers, like Jesus said in Mark 11, 24, in in the King James Version, Mark 11, 24, Jesus said, whatsoever things you desire, whatsoever things you what you desire. So desires, nobody has vague desires. How many believe in marital intimacy? How many even know what I'm talking about? <laughs> marital intimacy includes desires. When you desire to have physical intimacy with your spouse, you're usually not vague <laughs> about it. You're specific. You're not like, hey, let's hang out. <laughs> or you want to talk? <laughs> you got that, brother, didn't you? <laughs> He's like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> James 4 2 says you have not because you ask not. We're not specific. You got family members that need to be saved. Ask by name. God save this son of a gun name. So and so. You said me and my whole household to be saved. And that guy I grew up with that girl. I grew up with that guy in my household and I claim their salvation according to Acts 16, 32, which leads me to my next point. Don't only not only to be specific, but pray the promises of God. There is a promise for every desire that you have. And God has given us seven thousand promises in Second Corinthians, chapter one, verse 20 says all the promises of God are yes in Christ. And with us is the amen all when you go to God based on a promise, Lord, you said in your word, you'll supply all my needs according to your riches and glory. I need a job right now and I need that job to pay at least fifty thousand dollars in the name of Jesus. I'm asking you for that. I receive it and I thank you for it. Look at what it says in Second Corinthians, chapter one, verse 20. It says all of the promises of God. And I just prayed, you know, as a sample, I just prayed Philippians 419. But all the promises of God in him are yes. And since I'm in him, if any man belongs to Christ, I'm in him now. In him we live and move and have our being. I'm in him. And so all the promises of God in him are yes, not maybe. 
not no, they're all yes. And with us is the amen to the glory of God through us. So when you bring to God a promise from his word, he says yes, and you know what you need to say? Amen. And you know what amen means? It means so be it. Or it means uh, what he said. <laughs> You're coming into agreement with what Jesus said, with what God's promise said. You got it? You never have to go to pray and wonder and hope and maybe and did I do enough and did my good outweigh my bad? No, no, no. You're the righteousness of God. You have every right to pray and get answers and avail much. You are the seed of Abraham and when he prayed, God healed, God answered and you're the seed of Abraham so you're the heir according to promise. Be specific, go bold, get, state your desire and believe you receive it the moment you ask for it and realize that you don't deserve it but his blood does and he's freely given us all things by giving us his son Jesus. He's given us access to ask boldly for whatever it is we need and he will give it to us and realize that he responds to his promises. So pray the promises of God. We don't just make up stuff. The, the boundaries of what we can ask God for are the boundaries of his boundless promises that cover every area of our life. If we prayed and believed God every day for one thing in our lives, we would never run out of the promises of God because there are many promises in the word that apply to many areas of our life. You could live off of one promise for weeks and months and even years and yet God gives us 7,000 of them. And he doesn't say, you know, you're rolling the dice, you know, out of those 7,000 promises, 3,000 of them might be yes, 3,000 of them might be no, and 1,000 of them might be maybe no. He says all of them are yes. Let's stand together.